Okay, it's sort of trauma related. We're going to talk about concussion. This is actually right now a very timely topic in a lot of venues. Um, how many of you do sports related stuff in your jobs? Okay, not a bunch of you actually. So you guys should know this stuff and you probably know this stuff better than I do if you do this. But the reality is concussion has gained a lot of interest because we've learned a lot about the brain. In fact, there was a, a story yesterday in the LA Times, I don't know if you guys saw, but USC, Billy's Joint, just stole probably the two biggest neuro researchers on the planet from UCLA over to USC. And they're doing a lot of research on not concussion so much, but how the brain works and what happens when we damage it. And this, that's why the focus of concussion has become so prominent. Our kids are doing a lot of sports, and they're doing a lot of sports young. And sports-related concussion has gotten a lot of press for very good reasons. And I'll tell you where we stand right now. I'm not sure where it's going to go. Um, I'm not sure how much of this is as important as it sounds, although I think it probably is. And we'll go into some of the details of what's happened about concussion. So overall, first and foremost, as we go into this, what is a concussion? When I, I, I keep all my old medical textbooks, so I think it's fascinating, I just love it. So I went back and looked at the definition of concussion when I went to medical school back in the sort of Pleistocene era, long time ago, and it was defined, uh, part of its definition is you had to be knocked out or, and or have amnesia for the event. And then you weren't, otherwise you weren't called a concussion. We're wrong. We're completely wrong in that. And unfortunately, most of the information we have about that, most of the reason we know that we're wrong about that, comes from the military. We know very clearly that you do not have to get knocked out. And you do not have to have amnesia for an event to get some pretty significant concussive brain injuries. We are bringing back our our military guys time and time and time again with all of these basically blast injuries that joggle their brain enough to give them permanent brain trouble. So the definition of concussion has changed and it's important to understand that because it, it, it completely changes how we approach people both diagnostically and therapeutically, what we do for them. So the definition now, it, oh, and the um, fourth international sort of meeting on concussion and sports-related head injury occurred just, their papers came out of this just last November, and all of the concussion guidelines have been updated as of last November. So it's relatively recent in the last six months or so, so that a lot of these things you're gonna hear about are sort of cutting edge that have came out of the international meeting looking at this particular problem. The new definition of concussion has basically five components. First, concussion is caused by either a direct blow to the head, face, or neck, or elsewhere in the body with impulsive forces that are transmitted to the head, which is what our military guys get, right? They get an IAD, they get blasted, they you know, get this concussive injury that's not directly anywhere to their head, but it is an impulsive injury transmitted to the head. And that's, sort of, that's a big change from before. It, it causes short-lived short impairment of some neurologic function that then resolves on its own. You don't have to do anything for it, it resolves on its own. And that's anything from confusion to sort of staring off into space to being truly knocked out to being, having some memory problems. It, it includes anything that is a transient neurologic impair, uh, impairment that goes away. It results in the brain in neuropathologic changes. So if you were to take the brain of that person and do a biopsy of the brain of that person, there's a neuropathologic change, meaning that the damage being done is done on a cellular level, much more than on a macro level, like a subdural would be. So it's on a cellular level kind of damage. It's not structural injury, it's actually functional injury, cellular functional injury of the brain. It just, it, it leads to a sort of series of symptoms. So part number four is that concussion has a series of symptoms that tend to resolve over time that are often vague in nature. And we'll talk about the symptoms themselves, but they can be prolonged. And actually it's much more prolonged than we realized now that we know how to test for this stuff. So that's sort of part number four. And then part number five is neuroimaging is negative. So neuroimaging shows no damage. That part number five of the definition of concussion is what drives a lot of imaging that may actually be unnecessary. So part of what we're gonna talk about in this talk is when do you need to image somebody who may have had a concussion? We'll get into that, because one of the problems we have is we don't wanna image everybody who may have had an impulsive injury transmitted to the head. We would like to image people where we have a high yield of something that needs to have something done about it, like surgery. So we'll talk about those guidelines in a second. So that's the definition. The definition is new. So this does take that person who, you know, fell, bumped their head, or fell and, and got or blasted against a, a wall or thrown out of a car, and they may not have had direct head injury, but they were loopy at the time. 
that is a concussion. They're fine now. That's a concussion. All of that counts. So that's important. Now, how common is this? Abstract number three kind of looks at this. And what abstract number three is, is a paper that came out of the NAMSI's database. The NAMSI's database is the National Ambulatory Medical blah, blah, blah. Basically, it's an enormous database across the country in the United States that looks at what we do. It isn't, all it is is a database. So these are data dredging kind of studies. There's no cause and effect. It's just sort of um, a snapshot of what we're doing. And what they did in this particular paper is they looked at kids age zero to 19. Because what they wanted to do is look at what are concussive injuries in kids? Why do children get concussive injuries? Because there's some potential long-term effects of this in kids. What they basically looked at is this database that went from 2002 to 2006. Published, it was published in 2010. It was 2002 to 2006. And they found a couple of things about children with concuss concussions. 30 to 40% back then were sports related. So almost half, in fact it's more now than it was then, almost half of, of head injuries in children now are related to sports. Very important, if you have children, this is really important. Head injuries now are, are very, very commonly from sports. They're not from falling, they're not from car crashes, they're not from assaults, they're from sports. 70% of children in this particular database got imaged. That's important. Okay, imaging in that age range has some potential downsides. We'll talk to in a second, talk about in a second, but that is a lot of these kids got imaging. And that's something that's been addressed in a lot of these um, sort of guidelines. To figure, is there a way we can figure out how not to image all these children? Can we have higher yield as far as our clinical suspicion? And we'll get into that. 28% of these children went home with no discharge instructions related to their concussion. I will tell you right now, you cannot do that. And not only can you not, not do that, you have some specific things that you need to recommend as far as things like return to play if it's sports related that now are pretty standard that are very important. And we'll talk about that specifically. And 5% of these kids were admitted, meaning a lot of these were minor head injuries. These kids weren't really sick. Okay, they didn't have you know, something that, oh my goodness, they need to be in the hospital, but they had truly concussive injuries. So the, so the, um, the uh, sort of impact of this, the prevalence of this is quite high. We all have to be aware of this. Now, the other thing to know is that if you in your head have memorized sort of the Colorado scale or the different kinds of grading scales of concussion, erase them. They are gone. Okay, they are completely off the map. Grading scales are gone. And now it's determined more on neuropsychiatric or neuropsychological um, testing. We'll get into that as well. But just know that all that grading scale, if they were out for five minutes or one minute or, or they were amnestic, or, that doesn't count anymore. Okay, anymore. If you have a kid who had those sort of five features we talked about, that is a concussion. Grading has to, nothing to do with it anymore. And now you have sort of return to play guidelines that you need to follow in all cases like that. All cases. I will tell you in the last um, international meeting, they are trying to determine is there a severe concussion group and a less severe concussion group. They haven't quite gotten there yet, and I'll tell you why that is in a second, but, but they, they're trying to see do we have to do this pretty rigid return to play guideline in all kids, and probably yes, but they're trying to figure it out. Now what happens in there? If I get you know, my bell rung while I'm on the football field or I head a, a soccer ball and I get a little loopy after I do that, what's happening in there? Well, a couple things happen. The reason people lose consciousness is theoretically your brain kind of twists and get reticular activating system gets tweaked for a minute and you go down. Okay, that's the theory, and that probably is what happens. But also, if that's happening in your reticular activating system, that's happening all over your brain. So all over your brain, you're having basically damage done on a cellular level. What happens then is your neurotransmitters get all mucked up. Okay, they leak in the wrong place, they're going the wrong place, so your brain tries to fix it. In order to fix it, it starts to use ATP, it also uses glucose, and you end up with basically a hypoperfusion state in tiny little areas of the brain from a concussion. That is an area of the brain that is at risk currently if you use it too much. So if you have an area of the brain right now that's a little bit hypoperfused, you now are at risk of doing damage to that if you stress that area of the brain, which leads to why some of these return to play guidelines are out there. This is all on a micro level. This is all on something you can't measure in the emergency department. You can't test. And the reason they know a lot about this stuff is they do some amazing scans. The research end of this is fascinating. And they're doing things like glucose utilization scanning, which all these colors and show where the damage is and how things improve over time. It's remarkable data. 
It's really remarkable. And stuff that we can't measure in the ER. We're, very gr it's, we're taking a hammer to something that's this big. So it's very, very finite, very tiny areas that are, that are being damaged, but they are definitely damaged. And the studies really show that. So that's what's happening in there. What's happening to the person? So the person who has this concussion, the symptoms that they have, at the scene, they may be spacey. They may be out. They may have a little myoclonic jerking while they're out with it. They get up, they're staring off into space. They don't remember what happened. Or after they go home, they have the following types of symptoms. They have, I feel foggy. I can't concentrate. I can't remember anything. I feel sad. I feel happy and then I feel sad. I feel nervous. I'm sleepy. I sleep a lot. I have trouble going to sleep. Sounds like every normal teenager out there, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like every 14-year-old I've ever heard of. But they also have things like headache, balance problems, visual problems. These are all nonspecific symptoms that are all very important. Okay, they're telling you about that, that micro damage that's been done to the brain. And in particular in athletes, if you think about this, balance turns out to be a big problem in post-concussion stuff. In fact, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of entrepreneur, God bless America, there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit out there in America and um, in sort of the Western world. And when this whole new set of guidelines came out about what you do to return to play, and balance is a big part of it, people are developing all kinds of measuring tools. There's a great one that uses the Wii Fit. Do any of you guys have a Wii Fit? There are all these balance programs that come with the Wii Fit which I am terrible at. <laughs> I'm, 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 my little balance thing is going all over the place. That's how they test kids. They, actually, they do a program where you can test kids where they do the Wii Fit balance board and they see how their balance is because that's a big part of this. All of these things are vague, meaning that not only do we not recognize post-concussion, families and coaches really don't. Families in particular really don't. It's like, it's my normal crabby teenage kid who's you know, sleeping a lot, they all sleep a lot. Who has a headache, they always have headaches. This is a kid who actually has had some damage done in there. So the symptoms are vague, which leads to our conundrums. Who do we image? What do we do if we think they've had a concussion? And so those are the two big things that we'll, we'll kind of focus on now. And I'll tell you about return to play at the end of this thing. How do you image? If the, if the fifth part of the definition is they have negative imaging, but we don't want to image, how do we decide what to do? in these cases. So there are a couple of things about why imaging is a problem. We've already talked in the panel here, and, we, and it's sort of out in the LA Times and the New York Times, the, image, the risk of radiation. And it is real. It is absolutely real. And the younger you are, the more, and you get radiated, the more likely you are to go on and get something like cancer over time. It just is. It just is what it is. And if you're a jock and you get your bell rung five times over the course of your Pop Warner football to the end of your college career and you get five CT scans, your risk skyrockets for a risk of cancer. That's one of the reasons we don't want to image, particularly children. They have 70 more years on that chassis that they have to live through and they may very well develop cancer at that time. I'm, I'm 55. If I hit my head and you're worried about me, light me up. Have at it. I'm not going to live long enough for it to be a problem. But in a kid, they will. Okay, so that's, and the other issue is, if you, and it, this is very helpful if you want to convince a family not to scan their kid, is abstract number 10. This is a paper that has been used over and over and over again, and I think it's quite legitimate because it was sort of a social experiment that didn't, wasn't meant to be an experiment, but it turned out to be. What they did in this particular study is they looked at not just cancer. It's like, well, I'm worried about my kid today. If they get cancer 40 years from now, they do, whatever. I want to make sure they're okay today. That's so one argument is, and sometimes the cancer argument doesn't work. This one might, which is if you want your kid to go to Harvard, we may not want to radiate him or her today. This is basically a social experiment that happened in an era where hemangiomas of the head and neck in children, this is I believe in Sweden, were radiated. Before we realize that most of them will involute over time and that we don't need to do anything about them, they radiated these kids and they looked at the dose of radiation that these kids had gotten when they were young and how they performed on cognitive testing later. And there was a significant impact on cognitive testing if you had gotten your head radiated as a young person. Now, this isn't the same as CT radiation. This is pretty, this was real deal radiation radiation. But there is a potential impact on cognition. So as far as two arguments for you to convince a family not to scan them, one is I, I'm really worried about the risk of cancer down the line. The other is this may affect your child's cognition. And it may affect their, their thinking ability over time. There may be some damage done to that. So it's two kind of arguments for you to use. And then the third thing to use is for kids anyway, is know the PCARN guidelines. It is, so if you guys want, what I love to do, I forgot my iPad today. I actually will bring up MD Calc's PCARN calculator on my iPad. 
You can, take a, you can use it on a computer anywhere. You just Google PCARN, and, you, and, and it's an MDCalc. So MDCalc PCARN. What it pops up is the PCARN guidelines, which is basically an algorithmic approach developed with thousands of children to determine which kids don't need scans. Okay, the sort of the premise was we worry about kids who hit their heads. We know a lot of these kids are fine. Which kids don't need scans? And rather than take you through all of the steps of the algorithm and all the dividing points, what's nice about MDCalc is you can take it to the bedside and you can do it with the family. And the first question is the child two, over two or under two, yes or no. The next question is are there signs of a skull fracture, yes or no. And how alert is the child, blah, blah, blah. You just punch these little radio bullets. And what it'll do is pop up why the child doesn't need a CT scan. So if you, and make sure, what I always do ahead of time is make sure the child will end up in the doesn't need a head CT scan box, because otherwise if it pops up saying scan, it's like, oops. <laughs> I'll, like, I'll be right back, that was wrong. So, <laughs> so make sure you test it first, so you run through it yourself first. But it will say likelihood of a significant brain injury is 0.02%. Okay, and some, the, other, the other one's 0.04%. So it helps you with the family to say, I know you're worried, but here are all the reasons, and this is a really good research paper that explains why, and really, really your child is okay. PCARN basically decreased the CT um, use, not a ton, but significantly, about 20, 23, 24%, I believe, is what came out of PCARN. Means that we're, not scan we're still scanning a lot of kids, probably more than we should overall, but it's a nice guideline. It's a nice way for you to work it through with the family, why you don't need to get them scanned. Uh, and, it's, and it came from a lot of really good data. And there's similar stuff in adults. We have in adults, we have, the, um, if you get sort of pop down to abstract number 10, there are two sets of guidelines out there for head stuff in adults. There's the Canadian set of guidelines and the US side of guidelines in adults. And I'll tell you, the difference is pretty significant in who was in those two studies. So if you're from Canada, a lot of the Canadians used the guideline that came up from Ian Steele. The difference about the Canadian guidelines compared to the US guidelines was inclusion criteria and what we were, were worried about. In Canada, they wanted to know if you needed to have surgery. Guess what they did? They, do you need a neurosurgeon? So their inclusion criteria even went down to a GCS of 13. I will tell you in the US, somebody with a GCS of 13 pretty much always gets scanned. So the, t the two um, head CT guidelines are not equivalent in who was even entered into the study, and definitely not equivalent in what they were looking at as far as outcome. In Haydell's study, the, the Louisiana guidelines, the LSU New Orleans head, criteria, head CT um, guidelines, their inclusion criteria was basically GCS of 15. If you were 14, you, got, you weren't even in the study. They didn't even look at you. Their outcome that they cared about was a CT-definable lesion not necessarily something that needed to go to the OR. So they're quite different studies as far as what they, who they put in it and what they cared about at the end. Quite different. And how you decide to use them is totally up to you. You can use either, honestly. You can use either. Um, it just sort of depends on your practice environment. Um, but just know that each of them will decrease your use of CT scans in adults, but not by a ton. Neither one decreases it a lot. And I wanted to mention a little bit about um, Haydell's study, which is abstract number 13. Um, I think that if you use the New Orleans recommendations, most of us use them wrong. I will just posit that to you. Because most of us do most of those criteria, but not all of them. So just know that Haydell's criteria said that you don't need to scan somebody as long as they have none of the following things. No headache, no vomiting, they can't be over 60, they can't have drugs or alcohol on board, they can't have seized, they can't have any evidence of trauma above the clavicles, and that's any, which is one of the bugaboos about that. That's any, that's an abrasion, that's anything. And I think most of us know those criteria. The thing that most of us don't do routinely is they can also have no short-term memory deficits. I'm not sure all of us routinely check for that. So if you really are gonna use the New Orleans criteria purely, you need to be asking that, asking about you know, the three things and checking them again in five minutes and see if they have a memory deficit. And I think most of us let that kind of fall off the map, so we get a little sloppy. But overall, it, it picked up every injury if you did that. But we also, it didn't decrease scanning by a whole lot, and it wouldn't. It makes sense if those are the things you have to have. A lot of people who've had their head hit will have a headache. So just that, that one, these are fine. The guidelines work as far as imaging. Um, it doesn't decrease your scanning a lot in adults. It does quite a bit, though, in children. It do, it's the PCARN guidelines are great. So that's the imaging part. It has to have negative neuroimaging, but you don't have to image everybody. Okay, what you want to know is that it's gonna, is it either going to be positive or an OR. Those guidelines work for adults and children. So that's cool. Now, though, 
I think the kid's had a concussion, what do I do? You have to know the return to play guidelines, or basically what to do with somebody with a concussion. And we had a big debate on the panel about this at one of the courses, because these are quite rigid. Okay, they are quite rigid. And what they recommend in this is a six-step program, and you don't advance from one step to the next until you are completely in the groove in, the, in step one and then back to normal, and then you advance to step two. And if you're not normal at step two, you go back to step one, and you start over again. And, what, and for us in the ER, what it means is, you take that kid who's gotten his bell rung in the football game, and you tell him or her that they need to have cognitive and physical rest. What that, that means, they don't take a test, they don't play on their video games, they don't play on their cell phone, they don't play their sport, until they get evaluated and then advance to the next step if they're normal at that level. And then what they do is they evaluate through six steps. They can have basically light aerobic activity. Okay, you can take a walk. Okay, you can take a walk, we'll see how you do. And the testing that they do is based on, there are several different versions of this out there, but mo what's used most is what's called SCAT2, which is a very <laughs> extensive test that looks at memory, it looks at mood, it looks at sleep patterns, and it looks at balance, and it looks at ocular motor abnormalities, because all of those have to be normal until you advance to the next stage. And then you get to do light aerobic exercise and you get tested again. The reason this is important is when they've done this real testing on kids, they're still symptomatic a week later. And a significant proportion of them are still symptomatic on this really sophisticated testing four to five weeks later. To the point where if you want to play NCAA sports in the United States, you get tested first now. If you play a contact NCAA sport in the United States, so you go to college and you are the football jock, you get neurophysiologic or neuropsychological um, testing at the get-go so that they know how, what your baseline is when you get your bell rung and they don't let you go back to play until you've, you're back to your baseline. This is the same thing for all, and the younger kids, I'll tell you, the kids that are the most worrisome now are the soccer kids. Heading causes this stuff. So if you have a so I have an 11 year she, she turned 11 yesterday. I have an 11 year old niece who is a soccer jock. This kid is incredible and a really aggressive soccer player and really good at heading the ball. Worries the heck out of me that this kid is heading the ball multiple times on her three teams. You know, she's doing this all the time. This wonderful little brilliant brain. It worries me. It worries me. And this is the kind of stuff you need to be aware of. So when you have a kid who's had their bell rung, you got to tell them. Here's the story. You have some micro damage probably going on in your head and you need to have physical and psychological rest until you can get advanced through this. And most those of you that are involved in this probably do this repeated testing. For those of us who don't, our job is to just say you can't go back to play. And I'll tell you that is really hard, really hard. Um, where I work, we're on the border of an area called, a city called Compton, which is part of East LA. And it is a really, really rough place to grow up. And the only way to get out of Compton for some kids is with sports. And I took care of a kid a couple years back who was the jock who was getting all the scouts were there. He was the kid. And all the scouts were coming to the next week's game, and he had his chance to get a full-ride scholarship to get out of, the, out of the ghetto. But the week before, he got hit, and he went down. And his mom brought him in, and we, he was fine. He, they wanted him scanned. We got him scanned. And he had a normal, but he, I told him he couldn't go back to play. And that is a huge thing for a kid. I mean, that is his chance to get out. And I don't know what they did. Honestly, I don't know what they did. I don't know if they went back to play. I told them that they shouldn't. It's a tough decision. Same thing that we talked about on the panel about what if you're, what if you're a jock in school and you've got your, your next big test to get you your scholarship that's academic. You know, and the teacher says you've got to take the test or you fail the course. You can't do that. You can't let a kid take an exam where they may not do well because they had their bell rung and have their life just as affected on an on a academic basis. So this is tough stuff. And, and I think, honestly, the cleanest thing is to just say, don't, let's, let's, we'll write you notes to whoever we need to write notes to, we'll get you excuses for whatever we need to get you excuses for, but don't hurt that brain. One of the things we worry about, we get all freaked out about, is second impact syndrome. You know, and that we all know the stories. They get hit, they go down on the feet, they got hit last week, they get hit this week, they go down, they die. We had one just about a year ago up in Palos Verdes that happened. My, one of my colleagues who was the, the team physician for the high school team had the kid go down and got shipped down to our hospital and he died. And he'd been hit the week before. I will tell you that's overblown. It happens, it definitely happens. 
but it is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is repeated head injury to that little brain or anybody's brain. And as we know, you've seen Muhammad Ali, the guy can't even move. He has post-traumatic Parkinson's. He has pugilism. It's a syndrome. You'll get this also. You have the potential for this in kids. And the NFL now has 40% of the NFL players involved in a lawsuit against the NFL for head injuries. It's just a big problem. It's a huge issue. So for us overall, I think honestly, you just need to be aware that concussion is different than what it was when I went to school. And one of the arguments that's made by when we got on the panel is a lot of us had our bell rung back when. We're all educated, you know, medical practitioners. It didn't hurt us much. Who knows it didn't hurt you? Who knows what you could have been? You know, honestly, who knows it didn't hurt you? Honestly, I, this is probably overly cautious. But I think particularly in somebody who is at risk for going back and doing an, something where they may get hit again, it is a very good approach. If it's somebody who isn't in sports and they say, look, I want to go back to work, I need to go back, whatever, it's their decision. But when there is, they're in a position where they may get hit again, I think these guidelines are quite reasonable. Do you have any questions or can those of you who are involved in this stuff, has you seen changes in this? Yeah. As far as what what they um, so what they've done is they've done an algorithmic thing where they start but what they did is divide it by age by your initial physical exam which includes evidence of head trauma um, and uh, GCS and that's your first deciding point and if they have you know GCS below a certain thing or you have palpable evidence of head trauma you scan those kids and four percent of those kids had positive scans positive scans are what they looked at you get down below that now you get to symptoms okay and vom by the way vomiting. Vomiting doesn't count if you're under two in PCARN because you all know that. Those of you who have kids, they vomit when you look at them cross-eyed. You know, they just, kids barf. Under two, that's what their response to stress is to throw up. Okay, they do. And God bless them. They took it out. Barfing used to, and, and who said barf? It, they did, unfortunately, over two. It's, there's a, a quantity. Let's see, you barf once, you get one freebie. Then you barf twice, then that's not a freebie anymore. So they get into the, the, the um, clinical stuff is that second level. Uh, and then finally, if they don't have any of that jazz, you're done. And, it, and so as far as the break point, what they were looking at is positive scans. Um, and this it helps you tell them, your, your kid's fine. Your kid's really good. So did that answer your question? Yes, they did. They used a cutoff. Well, no, actually, what they did is they first went and looked at how many kids had positive scans. And what they were trying to do is catch all significant injuries which is, this is what you like, these guidelines, so catch all significant injuries, so that, and then, um, which they defined as a positive CT scan, okay, or somewhere that needed to be admitted. Catch all those kids, and, that, and being admitted didn't necessarily have to have a positive scan, you were just worried about them. Some intervention, I guess, is what they had. Um, and if you didn't have any of that, they said, okay, this pool of kids, who are they? So we don't have to do anything scanning-wise for this pool over here. So that's what their goal was, to find all positive scans and anything that needed intervention, including admission, which was kind of not necessarily important so okay I've got oh hand well come on down while we switch yeah uh, <laughs> yeah okay I will okay so she's asking about the other end of the spectrum the elderly um, there is no answer for you out there some of the guidelines that we use all the time eliminated people over a certain age so for instance, I believe the Canadian guidelines had a cutoff on age. The um, Haydell study didn't have enough people in the older age to tell you. And so the <laughs> we, had a, we had a woman day before yesterday um, who fell down seven, 97 years old, living independently, spit fire. Oh my God, she was hilarious. No wonder she's, she's healthy as a horse. And she, but she fell down seven steps, had a big goose egg on her head. And our trauma surgeon came in and said, oh, I'm good with her, she doesn't need her head scan. I was like, based on what? Really? Really? Yeah, she's awake and alert. I don't want to scan her head. It's like, really? 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 97. I can't tell you that that is a safe practice to do. And if I'm thinking about discharging her, I want a head CT scan now. We had this big discussion about this because there's no data. I can't give you data. There's not enough data to know. We do know that their brains are smaller. You've seen that sort of walnut on the CT scan of all of the shrunken down brain. And we know they're at increased risk of subdural hematoma. We also know their risk of cancer is virtually zip at that point in time. So I don't see any downside to scanning that person. So the older person where you're worried at all, especially if they're gonna go home, you really wanna scan. And God forbid they're on aspirin, Plavix, di, di, you know, Dibigatran, any of that stuff, because then it's totally unknown. So I think, I think a low th it, the issues are cost, really, only at that point in time. 
It's because it's a non-con scan, and the older they are, the more likely I am to light them up if they have head injury. There's a hand over here, too. Come on down, Greg. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Uh-huh. Where are you? Yeah, there's, um, I was speaking to somebody at the last course, and they had in their area, it was a small place in Ma Massachusetts, and they actually have a um, testing in all the schools for all the kids involved in contact sports, basically football, football and soccer primarily, and they do neuropsychological testing up front, and they talk to families about all of this. So the education's done up front, which is really cool, because then the parents come in totally getting it when their kid gets their head hit. They understand the whole process, which is, I'll tell you, that's a, that proactive stuff is fantastic. We'll talk about this on the panel, because I think it is interesting. A lot of the recommendations have been given I don't disagree with, but to think there's a literature base that says they shouldn't be calling with their cell phones or watching TV or things like that, a lot of that's very weak. I, I, you would agree that, mm -hmm. that, that we don't know why some of those things were added. You know, we'd like to see things, and all of us now are watching different sports being added. And I guess, really, it's we used to think it was only in men. No, women play soccer. And I've seen, some, I've seen some who got their bell rung big time. And, of course, the families are often upset that, well, there's the, the playoffs are this weekend and that kind of stuff, and you, you have to make the case. Don't we have experience with frozen shows? Mm. Uh, just frozen shows yeah. go back to normal activities and they think they can go. And is there any bit of difference? Totally justifiable, your concerns about this. I think we don't know. And the other um, thing is the kids who are getting tested in high school, they already know. Well, no, that, unfortunately, that's true, and you can game anything. So a lot of the kids are basically on purpose having a little bit of balance trouble and a little bit of, oh, I can't quite remember, so that their baseline starts out terrible. So then when they do get hit, they're at what was already a faked baseline, and you can game anything. Um, so I, I understand your uh, skepticism. Um, I'm not sure we know enough about this to know what's the right place, but I think but caution I in a young brain. A right sure. Now. By the way, it has come a long way because at the University of Michigan 35 years ago, they had two orthopods on the sideline who'd say, follow my finger. Do you know what day it is? And that was adequate. He's okay. He can go back in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it, it, it has come a long way. We're a lot better at this than we used to be.